He's alive. Happy Resurrection Weekend. Happy Easter. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much. Woo, excited crowd today. Come on, in Jesus' name. That is fantastic. All right. Well, for some of you that, uh, that don't know, I'm lead pastor Greg Dumas. Uh, I, I, if you've been coming for a little while, I'm the pastor you haven't seen yet. <laughs> uh, I ruptured my Achilles tendon some time ago and haven't been able to be here. I, I want to, before I go any further, just say thank you to our team who's done such an amazing job. Can we give them a big hand? Wow. Really, really great job. <clears throat> So uh, uh, I'm just kind of getting, getting mended up now, so please forgive me. I'll slip out right after the service, because and, and, uh, usually I go and, and greet, and they do the same thing down at South Shore with Pastor Hector. And so I promise, I promise, when I come back and I'm out there, I'm able to stand and walk and stuff, I'll be in prime hugging condition, okay? I'm, gonna, this, uh, this, I'm kind of built for hugging, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I'll, I'll be ready, and, and so uh, I'll be back real, real soon. Some of you today are, are, are asking the question, you know, what kind of... What kind of church is this? We're an uh, interdenominational church or a non-denominational church. If you had to put denominational labels on, on us, and although it's kind of wouldn't stick real good, we're kind of Baptocostal, okay? Uh, we're, we're, we're a little Baptist, a little costal, a little more costal than Baptist. We're life-giving, spirit-filled church. Believe that this word of God is true from the very first word to the end of the book in Revelation. <clears throat> We believe uh, we are who this book says we are. We believe he is who he says uh, he is, and we have what he says we have. In the name of Jesus, amen? Amen. Been here uh, 12 years. Church has been here 25 years. We've got two campuses, one here and one down in South Shore, right there on College Avenue. It's a little bit smaller, smaller gathering, though they have two services on Sunday. About 5,000 people uh, come to the church on a weekend, 5,000 bodies. There's probably 12,000 people that call the church their home. Uh, two campuses, those seven services over a weekend, another 1,500 or so who watch every weekend online all over the world. This weekend, we had like Singapore and all kinds of places, Afghanistan. Can we thank our military? Can we just say thank you? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We've got incredible ministries at the Crossing Church Children's Ministry, both campuses, junior high ministry doing incredible. Senior high ministry has outgrown their building. They're now in the uh, main auditorium on Wednesday. God doing fantastic things. Saturday night, we've got some new opportunities for you. Check it out. Join us on Saturday nights, four and six great opportunities to connect. We've got great food. Thanks for your, for your kids. Just that platform and opportunity. And you can wear your guilt-free T-shirt on Sunday when you go to Cracker Barrel, okay? In the name of Jesus. <laughs> uh, all right, let's do one more thing before we pray and, and jump in. Everybody has one of these. Would you pull it out for me? Everyone should have a card that looks like this. Hope is alive. Little response card, okay? Everybody, everybody, if you've been a member for, you know, a thousand years, today's your first time. Grab it. We love your information. We don't sell this or trade it. No one's coming to your house this week with a bunt cake, okay? We, we, that was funny. Yeah, that was funny. Yeah, you, you have to remember, old, you remember Visitation Sunday School? Anyway, okay. Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. Flip it over on the back side. We would love for you to tell us what you would like for us to teach on, okay? Lots of categories there. Uh, last year, the, and here's what we do. The, we track this year over year so that we can know we're making progress, you're making progress with us. 
uh, last year the three that were chosen most. What we'll do is we'll compile these and I'll teach it in September. We need a little time to do some research, get our stuff together, and we'll teach the series that you let us know about today in September. So last year the top three were, were, were this, handling stress, forgiveness, and dealing with difficult people. <laughs> I wonder if those are related. So if, we can, so if we can help you forgive difficult people, we can minimize your stress in the name of Jesus. You know, God is, God is good. We can get it done, all right? At the bottom of that page, there are some choices today for response. The whole reason why we're together today is that every person would be able to respond in the Lord to some degree or way <clears throat> as we move through to the end, the culmination of the message, okay? Let's go to the Lord and pray. <clears throat> Father, we love you today. Thank you that Jesus is risen. Thank you that he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Thank you, God, for power and authority. I pray that you would use the foolishness of teaching of man to move in the power of God. For it's in Christ's name we pray and all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Just really delighted that you're here with us today. If you've got a Bible, grab it. We're going to go to Romans, Romans chapter 10. We're going to use verse 9 through 14. You version application, if you've got your, your uh, tablet, your phone, you can pull that up, find the notes there. Here's the big idea today. Hope is alive. Come on, can we say alive? alive. And Jesus is alive. Hope is alive because our hope is in him. It's in him. So as we, as we launch in, what, what are you hoping for? What are you, what are you hoping for? How many of you are hoping for uh, lifelong love? Good, good, good. Okay. If you're married, do you want love? Singles, how about you? Hey, 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 okay. So we can have a desire and we can have the object of our desire and we could say, I hope, to, I hope they love me, I want my love to be in him, her. So it can be a concept or a person as we talk about hope. But there's so many things we can, we can uh, hope can be hung on the wrong thing. Here's what Ecclesiastes says, Ecclesiastes 1.14. I have seen all things that are under or done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, all right? There's a meaninglessness that we fall into when we say, I'm tired of doing this, or I'm tired of doing that. I'm tired of living this way. I'm tired of thinking this way. I'm tired of feeling like this. And, and we come to worship, and <clears throat> there's a weight and maybe a, a little bit of coldness. Or, and really, we want to have expressiveness, and we want to love and be loved. We, wanna, we really want to know that there's truth and reality in the world. We we don't want war, famine, and flood, and all those things, and yet we live in this broken and dark world. We have bumps and bruises in our relationships, and we end up getting into the place where everything, here's what, the, here's what it's saying, everything under the sun without God's perspective is meaningless. And so the, 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 the writer of Ecclesiastes, we think it might have been Solomon, who at the time was the most wealthy man in the world, had everything he could have. What he said was, I've tried everything, I've tasted everything, I've gone everywhere, I've done all that can be done, and there's a meaninglessness in it, and I, and I want that to change. I want it to be different in my life. It reminds me of a, I used to train. I was a personal trainer. <clears throat> I know I don't look like it right now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I've, I've had, a, had a few donuts lately. Anyway, <clears throat> I've been sitting around the house for weeks. It's terrible. Anyway. Uh, I, I, 25 years ago, I trained in Miami, um, and, and I trained at a place called Turnberry Isle. Some of you are familiar with it. It's a very posh and fountain blue, the fountain blue spa. And so my clientele was very, very wealthy. When I say wealthy, I mean super wealthy. And so we would go to lunch with the, the, the folks that I would train, and, and we're at lunch with a gentleman, and, and there's four of us. He pays about $600 for the lunch. It's, a, it's, it's an expensive lunch. And I was impressed at the time, and I go, wow, that's, that's really expensive. He goes, yeah, it's great. So he tells me all about his boat. He would pull up in a 110-foot yacht, 110-foot yacht, with the 12 guys out there washing the yacht with all their white, you know, their, their whites on, and they would literally roll out a red carpet for him to train me. <laughs> it was awesome. I'd go, one, two, three, stock market's changing, four, five. And I was, I was making about $175 an hour. He <laughs> hey. What's up? What's up? Um, we, learned, we learned that money isn't just to get great things and amass, you know, things that you could have in yourself and, and the way that makes you feel. We, here's what we learned, that money is for your provision, but it's also for the extension of the kingdom of God. And, and that money is, is, when God blesses you, it's to be a blessing to other people. It's to be a blessing. 
And so we're at this lunch, rewind, 25 years ago, and uh, he goes, you know, it's really not that big a deal. And I say, why? He goes, I've done everything you can do. He said, I'm so bored. He said, I've caught every fish I could catch. I've got everything on the wall that I can put on the wall. He said, I've, I've had, and he went through his relationships. I've had this person, this person, this person. And, and he, said, he said, I'm alone. And he said, I'm alone every day. He says, I do this. Uh, I, I sit down at lunch every day and I pay this exorbitant amount of money with people that I don't really know and that don't really care about me. And he said, uh, um, all I want is to be loved. And a 65-year-old, $100 million man, he was worth $100 million dollars, how many of you like to try that for a little while? You're like, I'll try, I'll try 100 million just for a minute to see if I could be happy. Just, let me just test it out for a minute. 100 million dollars. But here's what he said. My family hates each other. They're all in broken relationships because all they can think of is my account. That's all they, that's all they can think about is what's going to be left. And they're already fighting each other. He said, I'm not even gone yet. They're already fighting. I can't get them to come to lunch. They don't respond to my calls. Sometimes we think that finance is something that's going to set us free. And if you have great finance, it's actually a great burden. There's actually a great deal. There's not a lot of people that can handle $100 million. And, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, I go from lunch to lunch, dinner to dinner, and boat ride and all these things. And he said, I... I have nothing to look forward to. And they say, I have, I have nothing. No one wants to spend time with me because they all want my money. They just don't want me. They, they just don't want me. And he goes, it's a pretty hopeless existence. Pretty hopeless. And so from time to time, you know, we can, we can catch it, whether it's school or, you know, you, we, we think about our appearance or whatever it might be. We want to put our hope. Here, here's what we know. We hope in Jesus who is alive. He is ascended. He got up from the grave. I don't know anybody else. I don't know anybody else who's resurrected from the dead and claims to be God and says that you and me can have life in him if we just walk with him, okay? If we just say, God, I'm, I'm getting inside of you. I'm going I'm to go into eternity with you. So if, you, if we're talking about options and you talk about what you would believe or what you would want, there are two categories. I'm going to try to go through them very quickly. And so we've got one, which is non-religious. We've got another that is religious. And so I, I will move through these, uh, and, and hopefully you can find your place. Like, which one, what, what do I believe in? Who do I trust in? What do I, what do I hope in? Okay, number one, first category is non-religious. It's the atheist. A is non, and theist is God, non-theist. But here's the thing about atheism. Atheists, true atheists, say that they can prove that there is no God. Now that is a tall order. That is a tall order to say, I can prove to you that there isn't a God, all right? And, and, and then you get with agnostics, and agnostics say, maybe there's a God, maybe there's not a God. But what I think as an agnostic, okay, is that it's me. I'm in control of me, and it's my intellect, and it's science, something that's provable, and so on. So what we've got is we've got America that falls out of these ages, like intellectualism, all right, the enlightenment, and then modernity. We can prove some stuff. Now we're in post-modernity. And in post-modernity, we go, yeah, truth is my truth, your truth, our truth. Everybody has a truth, right? And so maybe there is, maybe there's not, but I'm going to really kind of trust in me as, as the guide. I'm going to be my own source. So if you were to take a plug, pull it out, looking for source, you would plug it right back into you. That is agnosticism. Now, I'm going to share a little joke with you, okay? And I want to, tell, I want to ask for forgiveness before I tell the joke, okay? Say, say Pastor... I forgive you. Thank you so much for that. What does a dyslexic, that means you switch your words around in categories, all right, agnostic, maybe I do, maybe I don't, I don't know, you got to prove it to me, insomniac do, okay? What does a dyslexic, agnostic, insomniac do? Stays awake all night, wondering if there really is a dog. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's still coming, it's still coming. <laughs> I told you, a little corny. I know, it's coming though. Some of you are like, what? Wait. <laughs> Dyslexic. Oh. oh, oh, hey. Some of you are just like, what? What just happened? What are you talking about? <laughs> I might be dyslexic and insomniac, but I know there is a God and his name is Jesus, who is the Christ. <laughs> I 
So if you drop down into the category when you're talking about religious, so you got non-religious and then you got there. And I, I might note that agnosticism, if you were to drop it into the theism bucket, we're going to look at the top 10 uh, religions and we'll brush by them real quick, nothing in depth. But if you were to drop it into that bucket, which is, it's non-God, but if you put it in the God bucket, it would be fourth with religious adherents or uh, uh, people who ascribe to self as their own religion. I, I, my intellect and science would be my own kind of religion. So here's the top 10 uh, in religion, okay? Jainism, Confucius, Confucianism, okay, from Confucius, Baha'ism, Judaism, Sikhism, that's a sick religion, uh, Sikhism, Buddhism, it really is a real thing, uh, Hinduism, Islam, and Christianity, that's the top 10. All right, and it's interesting. What you have is you have uh, Eastern religion and you have Middle Eastern religion, and in the Middle Eastern religion, you have three of the top ten: Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. All come from the same story. They all come from the Torah, the the first five books of the Bible. The the Jews who live today, the Hebrews, they chose Moses as their leader. All right, and they believe in the Torah. Their their book, what they their, what they trust in is the Torah. Okay, uh, is if you go to uh, to uh, Islam, then you come to a whole new leader, and they they choose their leader and they choose their book. All right, and then you got Christianity. We choose our leader and we choose our book. And so the question is, is which leader are we going to trust in if we're going to be theists? If we say, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose this one, and I'm going to have some credibility in the person that I choose. If it's Mohammed, and you're working through a, a, a theological structure that you're going to base your faith on, and maybe determine your history and your eternity, what does it, is it going to be the Quran? And, and how is that validated? Because you have, faith means I trust, everybody has faith right now to sit in your chair, right? You have faith. I'm, I'm I'm going to sit in this chair, and I'm, I'm not just hoping, I'm more than certain, unless my chair breaks, something goes weird, that this is going to hold me up. We have faith in our bank that when we write our check, they're going to have our money. I, I, I need to be more than just, I need to be more than hopeful that you have my money. So when we talk about Christian hope, it's based on the one that we put our faith in. So hope has to ride on faith. And for Christians, we say our leader is Jesus, and the basis for our hope is in the person that we have faith in who is Jesus the Christ and the efficacy or the reality of the Bible, its historicity, the archaeology, its source, its sources. When we talk about uh, 1,500 years in compilation and the, many, the 40 writers who wrote over those 15 years and the 66 books that all have one version, which is the redemption of man through the person of Jesus. We'd say, I'm not asking you to just believe in thin air. Just believe in something. No, no, no. Quantify what your faith is in so that your hope can ride on something that's dependable. So that your hope can ride on it. What we're doing in, in, at the Crossing Church is this year, we're developing a discipleship program where we teach you in depth why you know what you know and who you are in Christ so that you never have to worry about, you know, not, I, I know some stuff, I just don't know where it comes from and so on. We're going to teach you in depth what that means and what it looks like in, in, in Jesus, in, in the Christ, okay? Now, and so you've got a little bit of a lineup of, of theism and these top religions, and so let's, let's talk about Jesus for just a second. There's no other leader. This, is, this might be the, if you've never thought about this, this, this might help you. No other leader, Confucius, Buddha, no other leader, no other world religious leader ever said he was God. No one. They, they, never, they never claimed to be God. Muhammad never claimed to be God. And when you think about Islam and you, you think about the Quran, Muhammad said that Gabriel visited him, an angel, we all know Gabriel as well in the text, and that Gabriel inspired him and he wrote the, 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 the tenets of what we now know as Islam. But there's no, no one else around him that could say that is a credible source. Okay, when Jesus came, you've got all these 40 authors 
66 books that go back thousands of years, all tying to Jesus and to Christ. And then the church took these books called epistles and so on in the New Testament. And they said, this is the breathed word of God. And if this part doesn't line up, we won't keep it here. It was all source texted. It was all used in life. Everybody had to to go through the text to make sure that it was uh, uh, not just a variable text. It was dependable. So just the 66 prophecies about Jesus, just, and there's 300 or more prophecies from Old Testament to New Testament, but just 66, the mathematical probability of them being fulfilled in Messiah, that means in the Old Testament, they're saying, Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming. 400 years between Old Testament and New Testament, Jesus shows up, and that those 66 things would be met in the person of Jesus Christ down to what he was wearing when he was crucified, what he said when he was crucified, what those who crucified him said to him, how long he would be on the cross, that he would be in the grave for three days, and that he would be resurrected down to the very T of every circumstance. The probability of that would be like a tornado going through a trash dump and dumping out an iPhone. Whoop. Wow! That's incredible. No, it's impossible. It's in, there is, I could write the mathematical number for you, but it's nonsensical because it's this one with zeros and 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 zeros. When you trust in Jesus Christ, you're not just trusting, I think I just trust the Easter bunny, right? Do you remember when your parents told you, you know, I'm not even going to say it in here. I'll mess some people up. I was close. I'd have messed up on that one. I'm like, I hate you. You ruined. I was close. It's like ruin your world. It doesn't exist. Right? <laughs> no other leader claimed to be God. Look at John 1, 1 through 5. Jesus said, Here's what the Bible says. Here's what this word says. Which, by the way, if you want to, if you really want to study and look and understand this, um, there's a movie coming out. It's called Case for Christ. And uh, Lee Strobel was an investigative journalist in the Chicago Times, big, big Chicago Times. And he set out years ago, it's about 20 years ago, to disprove the Bible. He goes, you know what? I'm going to disprove this. This this is not relevant. The things in this book, they're not true. And he boxed himself in. He kept, he kept discovering, discovering. And if, if you go on this journey, what happens is the hallways get smaller and smaller and smaller. And you get boxed in by the truth of the Bible. He messed himself up and ended up trusting Christ as Savior. And he, he, he did. And, and so now it's, it's called the case for Christ. And he shows the world. He goes, there is more provability in the historicity, the facts, the geography, the archaeology, the books that are written, all the things, the witness of the Bible, the veracity of the truth, and the, you know, the 66 books and 40 authors. He's got all this stuff. He goes, it's absolutely, it's absolutely. Not only is it the only book in the world that no one has ever disproved as being true, Jesus Christ, and his, he does the same thing with the resurrection. You can't disprove it. Right. There, there's too much evidence to say, I, I just, you know, I don't, I don't know, Jesus, whatever. It's, but culturally, What's been happening for 50 years in America is we go, the Bible's not true, the Bible's not true, the Bible's not true, the Bible's not true, the Bible's not true. So what we hear is something that's parroted in culture. I want you to know that is not the substance of reality. I I want you to know that's not the substance of reality. Um, Jesus said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In the, Jesus is the only one that said, I'm God, and I've come for the removal of man's sin. I'm going to take your punishment, and you're going to go into eternity because of me and in me. It goes on. He was with God in the beginning. Jesus, through him, who? Jesus, all things were made. Without him, who? Jesus, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. Come on, somebody say life. 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 And he says, and that life was the light of men. It was the light of men. So when we talk about the person of Jesus, the Christ, and there's, and again, I could go on and on and on. The resurrection is everything. If you take all the tenets of Christianity and make them into a pyramid, 
You have to turn that pyramid upside down and say, I believe because of the resurrection. It's at the point of that, that resurrection that we know Jesus is the first fruits of those who are resurrected. When I put my faith in him, he clothes me and I go into eternity in him. I go in because he went. And that's the only way I get to go in. Now, what he says, what Jesus says, is contained in the scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. So we have the same thing the Hebrews have. We just have the extension of Jesus. We have the same thing Islam has. We just have the distinction of Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. So when we talk about art, literature, and things being substantiated, my daughter's in college, my middle daughter's in college, and she said, you can write, it's a literature class, and so on. You cannot cite the Bible as a credible source. Her professor said to her, and to the whole class, this is right here in town, and it's everywhere on college campuses, you, the Bible is not a credible source. That's what they say. So very quickly, let me tell you, you remember Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey? Everybody remember that? Okay, that was written 400 years after the characters that it was written about, and there are 600 manuscripts that you would look at to verify the Iliad and the Odyssey. And those things, the professor says, you can reference as citable sources. Uh, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, I hope that you just, it, just ring a bell. Okay. That was written 400 years after the people who wrote those, and there are 20 manuscripts. Those are credible sources. The New Testament, okay? The New Testament. Most of the New Testament was written between five years after Jesus died to 70 years after Jesus died. And there are 5,600 manuscripts in Greek and there are 8,000 manuscripts in Latin. So if you throw out the Bible, you have to throw out the Iliad and the Odyssey and Aristotle and Plato and Socrates. Amen. And so at some point, I'm going to go visit her teacher. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, not to be ugly, look, look, not to be ugly at all, but to say, if you don't think this is a credible source, it is not incumbent upon the student to prove to you that, that it is not credible. It's incumbent upon you to prove to me that it is not credible <laughs> because, because you can't do it. It's impossible to do. I mean, have fun. You'll end up getting saved. You know what I mean? You're like, I'm going to prove this wrong. Okay. Climb to the top of the mountain. God's like, Man, I've been waiting on you for a while. <laughs> I've been waiting for you to come talk to me. Here's what the Bible says. Join me in Romans chapter 10, 9 through 14. It says that if you confess, if you confess, you say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Come on, let's say it together. Jesus is Lord. Come on, say it with me. Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and you're justified. The gavel comes down and he says, uh, his penalty for my release, it's like a jail sentence. Somebody's got to be in, somebody's got to take that sentence. And the sinless, spotless one took the sentencing for us so that we could go free. God says, you're free. Not just because you're free because you're free. You're free because he paid the price. And it's with your mouth that you confess and that you're saved. So when you sign your house document, say, yes, I want to buy the house. They say, okay, here's the document. Sign. to Function. And what the Bible says is I'm confessing with my mouth as the signature that I'm trusting in Jesus. I'm believing in him. Okay? Then it goes on, saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Grace came through the Jews first, all right, and then to the Gentile world. The same Lord is Lord over all who richly blesses all who call on his name. For everyone, say everyone. everyone. Come on, in, in Greek, that word means everyone. It means everyone. It, it means everyone. Everyone at all time and any time. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be saved, everyone, every circumstance, every situation, every background, and so what we, what we want to do is we just want to exercise our faith, and we, we want to have, having just heard a little bit, like it's a tiny thumbnail, a tiny thumbnail of, 
of the veracity. I want you to know that when you trust in Christ, you're in good company. I want you to know when you trust in Jesus, your life will change. I want you to know, I'm not giving you pie in the sky. You also need to know this. When you trust in Christ, uh, things get a little tougher before they get easier. <laughs> Welcome to the crossing. God bless you. Amen. Here's the reason why. Because there's requirement in your faith. And the reason why people don't trust Christ is because they understand that there's a requirement in faith. And so we go, I think I'm just going to hang out with me and do the best I can. And when I get there, God's going to forgive me. Okay, look, look at the response card with me, okay? Grab your response card, all right? We're going to do this together. Every person in the house, those of you online, if, if you're in the South Pacific, grab, you can see it online. Grab, grab the card. I want you to go to the end here where it says spiritual response. There's some, some responses there on the page. I have already put my trust in, uh, in Jesus Christ. Today I've decided to give my life to Christ. Hope you make that decision. I'd like to consider it a little more. Come back. We'll, we'll teach you, encourage you. We'll have a coffee with you. We'll get you in a life group, help you understand the orientation, or I don't ever intend on making that decision. You say, why did you put the last one on the card? I don't ever intend on making the decision. Here's the reason why. I would rather you be truthful than be hypocritical. I really, I, so I hear people say, I, I, you know, talk to them, I can't come to your church. Why? Because if I came in the building, you know, lightning would strike, the building would fall on me. I'd be like, I'll, so I say to them, first of all, you're thinking way too much of yourself, okay? <laughs> You're thinking way too much of yourself. God is, not the respecter, God is not a respecter of man. However, he does respect Jesus. And so I want to ask you this broad question, in particular, if you've never trusted Christ, or if you say, I have trusted Christ in the past. Okay, something happens today, God forbid, God forbid. And I just prophesy in the name of Jesus, it's not happening today. You close your eyes for the last time, you're in eternity. Okay, you're standing there before God. It's his throne. And he says to you, why should I allow you into eternity? And 99.9% .9 of the answers that happen from Americans, not sure what's going on. I don't know. It's effective. little clueless. I'm just waiting for the next light cube. 99% of an American response is this. I'm good. I'm good. I was, I was good. I was good-ish. I tried to tell the truth-ish. I tried to raise my, my kids as best I could. I tried to love my neighbor the best I could. I gave a little bit of money. I served some homeless, I helped an old lady across the street one day. I was trying to be good, right? And there's also the distinction between I was better than, and we know somebody that, you know, we feel like we're better than. I'm better than Bill. He didn't tell the truth, you know. I'm better than. Let me tell you something. And then we, and then we presume on God and we say, and God's good, God's goodish. And he's going to let a goodish, most goodish people come on through. And that, that just makes sense, all right? But listen, this is counterintuitive. The only way into eternity is through the blood of Jesus. Amen. There is no other way. So a perfect God can't... Now, this is going to sound strange to you. And don't get tripped up on what I say. Listen to what I say after this. Only perfect people go into eternity. No one's perfect, and no one can do anything to be perfect. So in Jesus, what Jesus does is he wraps his cloak around you and me. He covers our sin and imperfection. Every thought, every broken thing, all of our sin, all of our insistence on doing it on our own. And the Father sees the Son and sees the forgiveness that he has given his Son and sees the blood that was paid for my price and your price. And the only way we go in is in Jesus. Because no other, no human can qualify to bridge that gap between God and man. Just the Son. And He is uniquely the Son of God. There is no other like Him. There's never been in history. There'll never be in history. He is uniquely the God-man. And so when we talk about having trusted in Christ or trusting in Christ, we simply exercise what our faith is. I don't know at all. But I know, that, I know that trusting in him will change my life. And I have hope. 
I have hope based on the character of the God that I'm trusting in. So here's what we're going to do. Very, very simple. And then I want to, you know, I'm going to ask you to just to fill, to check all of you, to check some place that we're moving today. Let's say this. Say, Lord Jesus, we're making our confession now. I'm not trying to trick you. Some person upset today. Oh, a little guy or girl. It's the last service, though. It's cool. Any service is cool, really. You know, I want you to do, before you, it's going to pause for a second. You don't have to close your eyes. I just want you to pause for a second. And I want you to know that God's always coming after you. Always. He'll never not stop coming after you. Never. Never. But what we do is we're so busy, we run. We just, you know, I've got stuff to do. Or I got, you know, and, and. I don't want to think about this and whatever, but I, but I tell you, eternity, time, it comes quicker than you think. Difficulty comes quicker than you think. Darkness comes quicker than you think. Hopelessness comes quicker than you think. Trouble comes quicker than you think. And, and, and let's not wait until we're there to make the decision. Let's not wait until we're at the gate of eternity and say, God, I beg you, please, please. Let's not wait. Let's not wait that long. I want to know he'll change your life. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to just while we're looking at each other like this, I want you to just say to God, I'm, I'm, I'm open. I'm, if you're real, this is what happened to me when I was a junior in college. If you're real, I want to know. I want to know. And I want to know right now. I don't want to know six weeks from now or whatever. I, I want to know now. I want to know. I want you to come to me, speak to me. I want you to know. I want to know. Just for a moment. Just incline yourself to the Lord, even in the tiniest bit. He'll uh, he'll change your life. If even if you've resisted Him your whole life, if you just so if this is the posture of resistance, even if you just stop resisting for a moment, He'll change your life. So let's say this together. Say, Lord Jesus, I give up today. Take my sin which is my insistence to do it on my own. I yield. I ask you, based on the truth of the word, to come into my life. Change my heart. Live from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Okay, now, listen, if 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 you made that declaration, both campuses, if you're all the way across the world, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And I know the tendency is we're in a big room and so on and you want to go. He was just, I said, I trusted Christ. Real quick. We call it the dino raise at the crossing where you go. Arms about that short. Could be the alligator raise. And I get it. I understand. I want to tell you what we're doing. The Bible says when someone trusts Christ, that there's a party that breaks out in heaven and there's, I don't know how many millions, maybe billions of angels, and there are these giant books in heaven called the Book of Life. And your name has been written in the Book of Life before you were ever born. Matter of fact, before the earth formed, God had the book. And all of the names that are written in that book, when we confess, when we're saying, I have, I'm in Jesus Christ, there are angels in heaven that are saying your name. And there's this party that breaks out in heaven. It's not a party the way we think of it, but there's rejoicing and singing to the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. And they're saying your name. And so what I want to do when I count to three is I'm going to ask you to raise your hand nice and tall, keep your hands up, and we're just going to join them and clap and thank God and cheer you on. And, and hopefully, you, you know, you, you move on in the things of God here or whatever church you go to, okay? So on the count of three. Raise your hand nice and tall. Every person who's trusting Christ on the count of three. One, two, three, wherever you are, all around the house. Come on. That is awesome. That is awesome. Woo! That is awesome. Come on. 
Hallelujah. Come on, we can do better than that, church. God bless you. God bless you, whole family. God bless you. You can put them down. Thank you. We can spend the rest of the afternoon doing that. Don't ever, ever, ever take it for granted, church. People trusting in Jesus Christ. There was a man in the last service. He said, he said, he said, he'd, been, uh, he said he'd been Muslim for 61 years, and he gave his life to Jesus today. Yeshua is his name. His name means salvation. Give me a second. So excited to invite you into his family. And we pray that, you know, you'd be able to take the next step. The greatest thing you can do is, is to be baptized, which is an act of faith. And, um, so in a couple of weeks, we've got this big, it's like an outdoor party, concert, slash, food, all stuff. And we, bap, we do baptism, water baptism. Some of you have trusted Christ, never been water baptized. And I, I baptized a guy in North Carolina one time and took him out of the water. And he's just vigorously pushing the water like this. I go, what are you doing? He goes, I'm sending my old man down the stream. So, so that's the right biblical picture of baptism. Buried in the water as Christ was buried in the grave. I don't think like that person anymore. I don't live like that person anymore. I don't want what that old person wanted. I am changed because the Holy Spirit now lives in me. And when I come out of that water, I, I live to walk in the newness of my faith in Jesus. That's the picture. So in a few weeks, we're doing baptism. I invite you to come out. It's a real, real fun party. We're going to see the video of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slip out. It's been my honor and privilege to share with you. Pray that we would see you back and we can help you in our church get to know the Lord and then Pastor Stan's going to come out and close the service. God bless you.